This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Again, it's wonderful to be among uh, distinguished colleagues, students, friends, uh, dear ones. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you, this is going to be a very intensive presentation because when we talked about organizing it, um, we decided that this audience would have a, a lot of tolerance for a high rate of information. Uh, and so that's what this one is going to be. If I'm going too fast, just, you know, stop me, let me know. Um, it seemed like it was going to be simple when you hear these learning objectives that, oh, well, there's just two learning objectives. You have to find, we're required to do this for the CME credit, uh, just these two things. But you'll see once we get going, I'm going to be showing you a lot. And part of it is to stimulate your imagination and to try to get you to uh, maybe come up with some hypotheses in the course of this. And uh, so uh, it's going to be, I'll tell you, it's going to be extremely broad ranging. So please bear, bear with me on it because You'll be amazed at all the ground that we're going to cover. Mostly related to uh, to light, so uh, or and to vitamin D, and a little bit of a personal story. This all this story all started out um, at the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health in 1974, when my younger brother, uh, now deceased, and I were um, asked to attend a seminar, and the seminar was given by Dr. Who. That dog in the window. I'm going to play this just for a moment. <laughs> I do hope that doggy is for sale. I read in the papers there are robbers oh, oh. with flashlights that shine in the dark. My love needs a doggy to protect him. So, uh... We got on a trail that eventually led to making some pretty uh, serious hypotheses regarding vitamin D. And when I get to the end of the talk, you'll see the reason for playing this old Patty Page uh, favorite. But at any rate, it was a hot day in July in 1974 in a building that preceded the existence of this one at 615 North Wolf Street in Baltimore when uh, my brother and I were uh, asked to sit down for a presentation by a speaker from the National Cancer Institute who came 80 miles on, in the hot weather. Apparently his air conditioning wasn't working because he was sweating nails. And he sat down his carousel and he said, uh, I've been directed by some crazy people, including President Nixon and Mary Lasker, to come up with a map of cancer in the United States. I think it's a waste of time. Tell you the truth, I'd rather be doing a study but they forced us to do it, and you're the closest university, and we're going to show you these maps, and you'll see more modern maps, but the same idea as the ones that were originally presented. Uh, Dr. Hoover is still at the National Cancer Institute, and uh, there hasn't been that much interest in these maps except from a few quarters, including the vitamin D quarter. So I'll show you a little bit about it. Um, he projected maps that look just like this one. This is colon cancer. And uh, the rates where it's red are like 23 to 30 per 100,000. And where it's blue, they're around 8 per 100,000 to 15 in our own country. And as you can see, it's kind of, to my brother and I, it was kind of startling that it was so low in the south. We weren't interested in particular in how high it was in the north, although it turned out to be important. But if you look like below the 400 contour, this is the intensity of sunlight, or like the states of Arizona and New Mexico, that, there just wasn't much of this disease, despite a high level of proficiency in detecting it and medical care. And we decided that, oh, holy cow, we had just driven across the United States from San Diego to Baltimore. This was the, essentially the first day, as I recall, of my first job. And uh, we didn't know what we were going to do, my brother and I, what we were going to work on. And all of a sudden, our whole course of our career was determined in one second when Robert Hoover projected this slide, uh, or one just about equivalent to it for an earlier period. 
And uh, we said, well, whatever it is, this is what we're going to do the rest of our lives. And it turned out that's how it panned out. Uh, and uh, the part of it that was a little confusing is, well, everybody agrees it's really low in the south. But how come it's not uniformly high across the northern tier of states? And that took about 10 years to parse out. But eventually, we determined that there was very thick air pollution over the northeastern quadrant of the United States from the burning of high sulfur coal that cam comes from the, uh, oh, the coal mines in Pennsylvania. And it's burned throughout the region. And it leaves something uh, behind that we've dubbed acid haze. And it almost never gets in the news. The only time I heard it mentioned was when John F. Kennedy Jr. crashed in, uh, en route to uh, Martha's Vineyard because he became disoriented when he got in a cloud of this stuff. And it's basically there all the time. It's about 4,000 feet thick. And it stays in the atmosphere usually until rain comes along. And then it precipitates, acidifying the lakes. And most people know it through its consequence for the lake's acid rain. Well, that's the place where that is. It also just happens that the northeastern quadrant of each continent in the northern hemisphere attracts ozone. So there's a very thick layer of ozone there markedly thicker than there is in the rest of the country. It just balls up there over that part of the country. There's also Arctic air masses that come down from Canada. And if you live in that region, you know how cold those can be. And those certainly keep people in, from being able to expose their skin, uh, which is, of course, needed to make vitamin D. So we immediately, within seconds, we said, it's vitamin D. That's what it is. Nobody's going to believe it. And nobody did for many, many years. But we stuck with it. Uh, it turned out that it was similar for breast cancer, with a couple of exceptions, San Diego and Los Angeles being one of them, uh, and the Bay Area. But our interpretation was that these are magnet areas. And uh, from my experience in living here in San Diego, almost everyone I talk to is not from San Diego. I'm one of the few natives I've met. And most people are from the northeastern quadrant. And uh, so at least the ones that I've talked to, but they come from all over. But there's a big draw of talented people from the northeast out to to these counties in, in California. And we think that's the reason for the effect, that it's maybe somewhat like MS, that there's a certain amount of establishment of the effect early in life. And then if you move, you may maintain the same risk throughout your life. With colon cancer, it's not that way. If you move from New York to Florida, you will eventually take on the rate in Florida. And, uh, but for this disease, it appears there is a certain amount of setting it, of it rather early in life. And these contours that you see, we had drawn by the Johns Hopkins artist who had much better things to do, I think he thought, but at least we knew where the sunlight was. And this is calories of sunlight uh, that reach the ground. And there, it's quite a bit different. It's 300 up in, uh, say, the Boston region versus about 475 where we are right now. And this is an, over the whole year. So this is a moment similar to that when uh, my brother and I first saw it. That's me on the left, him on the right. We didn't actually have a picture. But there's a movie called Our Mr. Sun, and it, it struck someone that it looked like the two of us looking at these maps. So I brought it just for your enjoyment. Um, and we did Sunny Side of the Street earlier. But this attendance at this seminar resulted in a bit of a friendship with Robert Hoover and a publication of a paper in 1980 called Do Sunlight and Vitamin D Reduce the Likelihood of Colon Cancer? Now, we didn't know it, but uh, Apperly and, had previously said that well, you know, when it's, there's a lot of sun, there's an inhibition or antagonism of cancer, but had not linked it with vitamin D. So our unique contribution was not realizing that it was present, but linking it with vitamin D. And in this paper, we also linked it with calcium, which turned out to be pretty good at preventing colon cancer, too. And this was the map we made for that original version with the Johns Hopkins artists. And uh, what I'm going to show you now, and this is going to tax your patients, but in the discussion preceding this, it was decided that, hey, let's show everybody all the different uh, associations that we publish between uh, either latitude or ultraviolet light adjusting for, adjusted for clouds. And we have a wonderful way of adjusting for clouds now, the International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project, ISKIP satellite. So when you see the horizontal axis is ultraviolet adjusted for clouds, it's actually solar irradiance. The percent is multiplied by that to get the ultraviolet, and then that is corrected for the percentage of cloud cover from the satellite. Where does skin cancer fit in this? Um, well, you know, it doesn't fit in it very well. It's higher at a, a lower latitudes. You get 
closer to the equator in Caucasians. But then on a world scheme, it, I, don't, I don't have the smiley for it because we didn't do a paper on it. Uh, it uh, it's very unpredictable because the, the skin becomes more pigmented as we get closer to the equator, and that reduces the risk. And so you get more or less a flat line. You certainly don't get a smiley. I'll show you what a smiley looks like. This one's for breast cancer. And this is typical of many uh, disorders. R squared is 43.43, which means that uh, the latitude accounts for 43% of the variation among the countries. And most people are rather surprised to see that, well, they're not necessarily, but New Zealand is always high, and it's always on the left side because that's the southern hemisphere. We use negative numbers to denote latitudes in the southern hemisphere. And for almost every cancer I'll be talking to you about, you'll see that New Zealand is, is quite high up there. And um, Argentina goes way down near uh, um, the um, Antarctic continent. And Uruguay and uh, so, some of the others are kind of surprising in the Southern Hemisphere. But always, almost always New Zealand is at the top. And in the Northern Hemisphere, it's usually Iceland. You see Iceland over there. But there are exceptions, like the USA, which has the highest rate of uh, cancer of the breast in the world, uh, Israel and um, these things are not without exceptions, although we think we know the reasons for the exceptions. You can look at it, uh, and Rafael Cuomo is here in the audience, and this is a paper that he worked on, on breast cancer premenopausal, and uh, you see it looks like that. And when you get to postmenopausal, this is what it looks like according to latitude. But generally speaking, if you look at the upper left there, you'll see New Zealand and a few other places. Uh, Occasionally, there'll be a high one if there's a particular issue in a country. In Egypt, where there's a lot of schistosomiasis, it'll be higher than the average for Egypt. And in countries where they drink mate tea, it tends to run a little higher than you would expect to see it. And uh, we've done a, a poster recently on that topic. So it looks like it's about the same for premenopausal and postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, but this was essentially the first one, and this is for colorectal cancer. As you can see, it's, it, the points begin to lie rather close to the line. Uh, and you wonder, what is this line? What is the smiley? Well, it's drawn by the computer. But if you, if you try to draw it yourself, you'll find that it's 1 minus the uh, cosine of the latitude. And the intensity of solar irradiance is, uh, proportional to one minus, is proportional to the cosine of the latitude. So this is just the opposite of the irradiance. The irradiance is, higher, is highest at the... Uh, at the midpoint, and it gets, uh, you know, further and further away from it, it gets higher, uh, so that you are uh, lower, so that when you're down in New Zealand, you have extremely low irradiance, and when you're up in those countries in the northern uh, areas, it's, you know, it's quite high irradiance, but uh, high cancer, but low irradiance. And uh, there's two, about 175 countries uh, data represented here. And this is only possible because the UN releases GlobalCan, which tells us the age standardized incidence rate of cancer in, in 172 countries of the world. They work very hard on this. Um, this is pancreatic cancer. And you see it's rather similar to colon cancer. And um, the, what you're seeing on the horizontal axis for both of these is a cloud-adjusted uh, irradiance um, and uh, with all values. Um, um, index so that the equator is in the middle of this and the negative values are just denoted you know, negative because they're in the southern hemisphere, but allows the same kind of a display which we call a smiley. Now I'm showing you the displays for men, but they are essentially the same for women. You, can, you have to go across the room and really look closely to tell which is which. Here's ovarian cancer and uh, uh, it's not as strong. There's probably another factor involved in it. Uh, and this one is for brain cancer, and uh, it is an effect that's present. New Zealand is almost always up in the upper left, and countries which uh, have a lot of air pollution or really high latitudes are almost always in the upper right. And here's bladder cancer, and vitamin D is now being used to treat bladder cancer. We've written some papers on this. Oh, and there's the Egypt example. You see most of the lines conform, points conform roughly to the cosine, one minus cosine. But Egypt is way up there, and that is because so many people work in the Nile that they picked up schistosomes that live in their bladder, causing chronic irritation in the bladder, and that leads to uh, bladder cancer. Bladder uh, vitamin D works especially well with BCG in the treatment of bladder cancer. 
both sides are just the northern and southern hemispheres of the world. On the left side, there are not as many countries. So you see when you get to, say, NZL, which is New Zealand, that's a latitude of 40 degrees south of the equator, and it has a rate of 10. Whereas when you get down to uh, the countries that are really quite sunny, you see that the rate might be two or three, almost a zero when you get to the extremely sunny places. And then on the other side of the curve, um, you'll see that as you get up to the right, some of these are due to high latitude, uh, but there's Iceland about where it belongs near the line, but some are high latitude interacting with air pollution, such as Luxembourg, uh, a little country but it still burns high sulfur coal, uh, Italy and Spain, Italy, Italy's gone to a lot of high sulfur coal now, and you see these there's a more of an effect of pollution in the northern hemisphere than in the southern, and it seems to make the points for areas that are highly polluted jump even further above the line than would be predicted on the basis of latitude. That's all that's about. Here's kidney cancer. You see it's kind of a similar pattern. This one, Uruguay, stood out, and Rafael and I realized that this is the country where 90% of people consume a carcinogen tea called mate, and they're paying a price for it. Uh, this is, uh, looks like you can just see the top multiple myeloma. We just had this paper uh, accepted, and this shows multiple myeloma throughout the world. And the usual suspects are up high. You can see New Zealand almost in the ceiling, you know, it's way up there. And New Zealand is, I think if there was one place to live that I would not want to live, having studied this, it would be New Zealand. Almost all of these have New Zealand up high. No, but everybody in the mate field has told us that, uh, that there's two kinds, that the mate that's made in one place or is popular in one area is smoked, and the, and the other mate is not smoked, and we're pursuing that now. It seems to be the smoked one that causes, that's the one that has the problem. You can consume the unsmoked and you're okay if you're a mate fan. Uh, not many people are, but I had a student that all he would do from dawn to dusk was drink mate, and uh, I realized it's pretty influential. Comes in a silver sphere with a metal, uh, metal straw, and you just sip it all day long. Um, it's a cultural practice. Comments on mate? Yes. I grew up in Argentina. Well, yes. I, I drink mate, and the silver mouth helps when you pass it around the social complex not to pass around the germs, but I agree with the comment about smoked versus unsmoked. I'm yes. Thinking a liter of mate every morning for its iron pro processes. I bought the smoked kind once, and I got sick within two weeks. I see. So that's my personal well, experience. It's good personal testimony. Thank you. <laughs> Usually, the mention of mate inspires people. It draws <laughs> on a certain emotion. I'm glad that well, that worked out that way today, too. I'm glad I brought it up. OK. Here's leukemia. You see New Zealand usually leading where it usually does on the left side and the usual suspects on the right side. Uh, so, you know, previously it was suggested that sunlight might influence disease or cancer risk, although it just wasn't, the connection with vitamin D wasn't made until recently. But Hippocrates said always pick the sunny side of a hill to live on, and Aperleaf said that sunlight fights uh, cancer. So for colon cancer, we now have studies of individuals. They go pretty far back. This was our first one in 1985. And uh, at that time, these, were the, the, I mean, these are the results, oral intake of vitamin D. What it amounts to is if you get down to the, that green bar, the third bar over is 155 international units a day of vitamin D. You take your rate down to like seven compared to 30 or so in, uh, these are Chicago Western Electric Telephone Assemblers. And we thought when we published this that people would start taking some vitamin D. It was just a small amount and the effect was pretty profound. But nobody paid a bit of attention to it, of course, <laughs> even in the Lancet, you know? 19-year follow-up study using plastic food models. It's, this is the Western Electric study, which is the same study that linked cholesterol with heart disease. So we thought, well, maybe a different way to do it would be to use some samples we had collected in the past. And fortunately, my colleagues and I had collected 25,620 samples of blood and divided them in, into two aliquots each put half of them under the Johns Hopkins Hospital and half of them under a mental hospital, the Western Maryland Center, in case there was an attack on Baltimore. 
And they were still there. There was a, you know, maybe it was eight years later. We said, well, maybe if we look at the vitamin D in the blood, people will pay more attention to it than if we look at it in the diet, because the diet is a small proportion. Some investigators have found that 95% of the vitamin D in our circulation is from in the sun, being in the sun. So maybe this will do it. We thought, maybe, maybe we'll get it. So we had uh, 25,620 volunteers, and uh, we sent five big old trucks out. You know, blood mobiles is what it amounted to, and collected the blood. We had 34 cases and 67 controls, and they were matched as shown. And this is what we found. It was that if your 25 OHD was greater than or equal to 30 nanograms per ml, you had half as much um, of it. And if it was, uh, even the split at 25 was at 0.3, a third as much colon cancer if you were at 25 or greater versus zero uh, to 10. But it e was equally uh, disregarded. No one thought, oh, why would we try to raise our vitamin D? You know, it just, it says it. I'm, a, I'm surprised at the amount of inertia that exists in the world. But people keep repeating these studies. This is the most recent one. And it had such a long list of authors, I thought you just might enjoy an opportunity to scrutinize who they all were. Uh, one or two of them were my former students, I'm happy to say. Uh, but this is what it found, and it shows that you know, the students do better than the professor. I had kind of a bumpy curve. And this is what the students came up with, these students that had, did a study of 520,000 people, as I recall now, in 10 European countries. And doggone it, as that 25 OHD goes up, that risk for cancer of the bowel goes down. And I still think that people don't believe it. And you know, I almost wonder how many studies we have to do before anyone accepts the idea that you know, you're higher your 25 OHD, the lower your risk of the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. But life goes on. Here's the um, relative risk of colon cancer. And this is in NHANES. This is the national cohort. And if you look at death from cancer of the bowel, it's, uh, you know, if you get up to 32 nanograms per ml, you're going to prevent um, most of it. You know, you'll leave, it's a relative risk of, uh, 0.28, so you know about 70% down, just with a modest 32 nanograms per ml, which I remember the day when we thought that, ooh, do we want to get up that high? But I no longer have that feeling, and you'll see why as things go along. This is uh, 25 OHD studies, and uh, it just shows you the dose response gradient. And for almost every cancer we study, the, if you look at the median 25 OHD in nanograms per ml, that's why I'm you know, I don't want to change the nanomoles particularly because you can predict the reduction in the incidence of the cancer just by knowing the nanograms. If it's 40 nanograms, it's going to be a 40% reduction. If it's 70, it's going to be 70% reduction. As far as I'm concerned, with a little mild extrapolation. And even for breast cancer, extrapolation isn't needed. So the only thing we're losing when we go to nanomoles is this easy conversion from the serum level to the amount of reduction in the uh, risk. But here's breast cancer. Now this one's the kicker because when I started out in this, I was mainly interested in colon cancer, but pretty rapidly got to the decision that the lowest, the, the, the biggest thing epidemiology could do in, during my lifetime would be to get rid of breast cancer. It's early in life, causes a lot of, of uh, years of life lost, uh, people who have children. Uh, it's just a terrible thing. And, it's got exactly the same pattern as colorectal cancer. You can just read the nanograms per ml, and that will tell you how much lower the risk is. And actually, it was proven by Low et al., in my opinion, in a study many years ago, where when they got all the way up to 60 nanograms per ml, and you know they were down at uh, an odds ratio of, of uh, you know, point less than 0.2. Uh, so that's about 90 percent, almost 90 percent reduction if you could get people up to 60 nanograms. So that's one of the reasons that Grassroots Health has a recommended uh, serum 25 OHD target of 60 uh, or so, 40 to 60 nanograms. But as you can see from these data, 60 is the better end of that distribution rather than 40 because you're gonna get a 60, well, you're gonna almost eradicate it if you get up around 70 or 80. So um, this is, uh, you know, another way of, of looking at it, uh, this is based on 
the nurse's health study. And you find it's, it's always about the same. It's uh, 42 nanograms, it's 30% lower risk. Uh, it's pretty reproducible finding. This one is uh, from, uh, this is a pool analysis we did of, of several studies. And again, if you get to 50 nanograms, it's 50% projected lower risk. It gets easy to draw these curves because we always know in advance what they're going to look like. They're all about the same. Uh, so this is multivariate adjusted for premenopausal. Now, some of my colleagues have said, oh, well, I accept your theory that, uh, that vitamin D prevents postmenopausal breast cancer, but I do not, I do not believe it prevents premenopausal. But here's the story for premenopausal. Say you're down less than 12. That's the reference. Say you're 12 to 18. Well, that's what it looks like. You're you know, down 32% of it or so. You get to uh, 18 to 23, you're down a little more. And then finally, when you get up to uh, 24 or higher, you're, you're down lower. To me, this represents at le a, uh, it's gonna be linear dose response relationship. The data are thinner, so we just presented data for quartiles, thinner at the higher end. But it gives me no reason to believe this is anything but a, a linear downward relationship with the occasional flattening of the curve or even U-shape due to an artifact of people self-dosing uh, vitamin D when they're not feeling so well or their relatives feel they aren't. Uh, so it's highly significant and there's a dose response. And then what about postmenopausal? Well, this is what it looks like. For postmenopausal, this is a case control study. But as you can see, these studies are, they're pretty consistent. Uh, so we're down to, uh, with, with 24 nanograms, we're down to point uh, 0.43. So, you know, we're getting rid of 57% uh, in a sense of uh, postmenopausal breast cancer just by getting people up to 24. But my question is really why should we stop at that point? Here's mortality, uh, and this again is the nation's cohort. This is the definitive cohort for the U.S. in some ways for the world. And there it is, it's a uh, relative risk of 0.28. So it's 72% lower mortality. If you just get people up to 25, and holy cow, the national average is 24, so that's not asking much <laughs> if you want to save lives, if that's your intent. Uh, so we did this meta-analysis, and there were five ordinary case control studies and six nested case control studies. And five ordinary ones were positive, it was significant. And uh, for the nested case control studies, for uh, were positive. They were significant, taken as a group, although not individually. And uh, the two bombed out. They didn't find it. They were neutral. But if you like to see it visually, these are the studies. In the bottom, you see the case control studies. They tend to have the the strongest favorable effects. You can see, like, the, there's one there, and the fourth one down in the lower panel uh, that's down at about, say, 0.2, which is 80% reduction in the highest quartile compared to the lowest. 80% lower in the highest quartile. Overall, it was a 60% reduction in risk in the case control studies, all ordinary ones, and a little less it was in the nested case control studies. Well, as William Grant has pointed out in a paper, um, the case control studies, they are actually more up to date because they're getting the blood just at or before the time of diagnosis, whereas the nested case control studies, it's often many years when the, between when the sample was collected and the event occurred, the, the, the fatal event or the uh, incident of event. And so the data are outdated for the nested case control studies, oddly for breast cancer, but are more current for the case control studies. On the other hand, some people think that the beneficial results in the case control studies are reverse causation. I don't believe that to be true because it can't account for the, the latitudinal differences, which are, are quite massive. Uh, but um, this is some uh, work at NHRC, the Naval Health Research Center. These are women in the Navy, and bl blood is collected on them every year or two and frozen away. And it's been going on for a long time, so we, we picked 600 cases, 600 controls, uh, matched them on the date blood was drawn, plus or minus two days. And you may think, why plus or minus two days? I mean, how close can you match something? Well, it's because we could. It's such a large population. And it does reduce the noise of variation from day to day and month to month and year to year. And all this work, getting all these samples, you know, 
spending the money, everything that went into it, and found exactly the same thing as every previous study. 50% reduction if you got up to approximately 50 nanograms per ml. So I'm getting to the point like where I want to put on a turban or something just to, you know, <laughs> meditate on why people aren't acting on this. Uh. <laughs> Do you think it's because people consider vitamin D a dietary supplement versus something that's... Consistent? Yeah, probably, yeah. It's not a pharma. You know, that's true. I think it is. So uh, these are women with early stage breast cancer in Toronto. Again, pretty much the same findings. I'm showing them all to you because I believe you have a high tolerance for information and can just want to see what the results look like. Um, this is breast cancer survival. Now this is a little different. This is once you have it, are you going to be more likely to uh, survive if you're high? Well, if you're less than 14, you're twice as likely to die. So you'd be crazy to have breast cancer and not take vitamin D, in my opinion. And this is just getting up to 22 nanograms per mil. But, um, it, you know, it does the job, even if you already have the breast cancer. Risk of mortality, uh, these are people uh, with non-metastatic breast cancer, although it includes a lymphatic invasion. And uh, this is what happens, a 70% lower uh, risk of dying if you've got just a little vitamin D. This is 10,000 IU per week. So, and... Uh, so and it's, let's take a look at colon cancer, just because I know you can tolerate, I'm hoping you can tolerate all this information here, but it's just to get the general idea in a sense. And yeah, it goes down. It's like a third as much mortality if you're up at uh, 40 nanograms per ml. And uh, so it's there, and this is from, this is from the Harvard uh, um, Cancer Research Center. So, uh, you know, I hope I've convinced you that Vitamin D <laughs> prevents breast cancer, prevents colon cancer, uh, breast cancer, premenopausal and postmenopausal, and it makes your survival way better if you are taking vitamin D or have a decent level of 25 OHD. So um, anyway, people often ask me, well, how does it, how does it work? And uh, uh, it's not a complicated mechanism. It's present in the same in every tissue. The epithelial tissues are generally monolayers in anything that's got to absorb or secrete, and they're bound together by uh, junctions, and the junctions are made out of E cadherin, which is strongly upregulated by vitamin D, and it's a glue that glues them together. If there's not enough of the glue, uh, these are examples of the junctions, they, are, um, they become soluble, they become internalized into the cells, and the cells take on a kind of a strange, less polar look and uh, they begin, rather than to cooperate, to compete. And the very first finding in the science of carcinogenesis was that uh, cells that are not in direct contact with their neighbors will go into a, a, a mode of reproducing because they'll assume that there's nobody nearby. And my secret sur for survival in the last 3.5 billion years has been to reproduce when in doubt. So you get a rapid reproductive rate. These are examples of some of the uh, intercellular junctions. My favorite is the flamingo uh, cad here and the third one down, but they take all kinds of shapes. But basically, they are something that grew from cilia and one cell grabs the other cell. They require calcium to stick together. There's a little bit of calcium in these calcium-dependent hinges. And if you take the calcium down really low, they will also disconnect. You can either reduce vitamin D or calcium and you get the same thing. The cells don't stick together, they lose their polarity, and rather than cooperating, they begin to compete. And there are other theories that are, are amenable with this and harmonious, the two-hit theory, the many-hit theory, but it's evolution, and uh, evolution's rate is controlled by um, the number of hits or the number of, of polymorphisms that are introduced uh, and the reproductive rate, and the two of them together determine what cells will predominate. It says you raise it from a mutant seed, you whack it, and of course there are mutations involved in cancer. Although the number is so great that it probably isn't worth tracking them down because it's not the individual mutations that matter, it's the precondition of competition created by the low vitamin D in the tissues. We call it the micro-Darwinian theory or the dynamite theory. And the first lesion is not initiation or harm to the, to the DNA, it's that the intercellular junction is harmed unleashing natural selection. And as we know as, bio, you know, as in a way medical biologists, natural selection is the main engine of formation and growth 
of just about everything, including malignancy. Uh, and it's got these steps. This junction is the key one that's the loss of the tight junctions. And all the other steps are there. But oddly enough, in addition to dysfunction, disjunction being the first one, um, these other steps, virtually all of them are um, inhibited by vitamin D. And there's something about vitamin D. It's active at 200 in 2,000 different sites on the genome that blocks the uh, progress of cancer at each of these stages in the dynamite model. So now here we are to looking at vitamin D intake, and now we're getting down to the nitty gritty of practically how you get people up to vitamin D levels that will prevent cancer. And as I mentioned, the very hardest to prevent with vitamin D is breast cancer. Um, but even when vitamin D intake gets up pretty high, like say 6,000 on you per day, you see there's quite a bit of variation. And that's the main point of this slide. And this is from the grassroots health cohort where we know every six months or so what people are taking in and, they're, and every year at least they're 25 OHD level. So uh, if you take 4,000 IU a day, three quarters will have 40 nanograms or higher. If you get it up to uh, 5,000 IU, it'll be 83%. 8,000 IU and you've got 98%. And usually that's where we want to aim because we don't want it to suggest a serum level that's an average because that means that half the people will be below it, half the people will be above it. So by selecting a serum level or an intake, in this case, that's uh, low, uh, you assure that half the people will be deficient. And it's better to select a serum level or an intake that covers 98% of the population uh, because uh, you will have the maximum effect from whatever you're doing. So uh, my feeling on it is that we need to recommend a baseline intake of at least the Thule's. And they, the National Academy of Sciences has made this very easy for us because on one page they publish a table that shows the age on the left side, the, uh, our, the recommended daily intake next to it, and then right next to it, equally prominent is the tolerable upper level intake, which means the amount that they decided in 2011 is okay for most people to take throughout life. And it starts out at 1,000 IU at birth, which is higher than the 400 IU most people think of for a baby. And by age nine, it's at 4,000 IU per day. Uh, so, you know, while we're doing the research, I think we would be prudent to get everybody on this level that's accepted by the National Academy of Sciences as being tolerable. And then my opinion would be we should universally measure 25 OHD in March just to know what we're dealing with. And March is the low point. If you're going to measure it, you may as well measure at the low point. Uh, and titrate the vitamin D orally to you get up to the value that you're looking for, generally 50 or greater. And I would suggest that we do field trials of 10,000 IU per day of vitamin D and some calcium because the study from uh, Dr. Haney's group, John Lappy, showed that calcium does uh, increase the uh, anti-carcinogen effect of vitamin D. Field trials uh, in children, I think, would be very valuable to do. 4,000 IU per day with 600 milligrams of calcium. Well, I think we should continue the nested case control studies. Although with colon cancer, we have so many that why do anymore? You know, it's, to me, it's ad nauseum. It would be a waste of time. Uh, for patients, yeah, vitamin D, 20 to 40,000 IU per day, uh, checking the serum regularly and the calcium regularly. And that's something we could start right away, whether as clinical trials or not. Either way, natural experiments. Luckily, sometimes we have a study that will look at, for example, 25 OHD in women wearing the veil in uh, Saudi Arabia. And those women run a vitamin D of about two or three nanograms per ml. And they have six times the incidence of breast cancer. Uh, so sometimes we'll, we get insights from things like that. And I would start a registry of 20, every 25 OHD test given to a child with a follow-up through the computer, say, uh, every two years to see if we're suppressing type 1 diabetes and other diseases. So these are for various diseases. We have a big a chart of these for all the different diseases that can be prevented with vitamin D. I think there's like 25 of them. This is just an excerpt to show you that breast cancer is much harder to prevent. The 50% is with 50 nanograms per ml and 76% with about 76 nanograms. But if we want to eradicate it, and my opinion is, why not? You know, life is short. It's a miserable disease. Let's eradicate it. We have to get up to um, 100 nanograms per ml if that's our goal. 
but I think it's a decent goal. And even though there may be a downside to that, there may be a few cases of hypercalcemia, compared to breast cancer, hypercalcemia is a somewhat mild diagnosis. Um, so this is what makes breast cancer the toughie, though. Well, I'm almost at the wall. Uh, I like to show these, of, of these little guys, just to clear, you know, make a point. The, the animal on the left has had his vitamin D system uh, interfered with, and the animal on the right has a normal vitamin D system. Well, they look pretty similar when they're young, you know, just a few months. But by the time they're eight and a half months old, the, the animal that had the vitamin D system blocked is, he's lost all his hair and he's turned really wrinkly. And so you know from this that uh, if you want to avoid wrinkles, and it's surprising how many people would like to do that, a vitamin D might do it. The other thing, and this is where the doggy in the window came in, is that uh, uh, it, it turns out that, uh, that you, if you have a higher serum 25 OHD in dogs, this is just a recent publication from Veterinary and Comparative Oncology, if you get up to 40 nanograms per mil, you prevent a pretty good chunk of cancer in dogs. It goes down to a relative risk of about 0.5. And uh, so it's actually four times as much cancer in dogs if you're below 40 nanograms. And this is the table that that was based on. Uh, and what you'll see here is that um, these investigators were not interested in vitamin D. They were interested in uh, CRP. And it didn't pan out. The black dots, the black triangles are cancer cases. The black diamond is a benign case. So when you look at it, you think, oh, well, they didn't find anything with CRP, which is a compound, is an indicator of inflammation. But uh, if you look at 25 OHD, and I love these serendipitous findings, if you keep it at 100 nanograms per ml, there was only one case of cancer. And it was almost like an aside. It was the seventh figure in the paper. And the last line says, normal dogs uh, that are insufficient should be considered at risk of disease. And while vitamin D is variable, all dogs with disease are insufficient except for one. Uh, so it, it seems to me that, <laughs> with it, that we're going to be able to prevent cancer in dogs before we were able to prevent it in humans because people don't care so much about the complications of having 100 nanograms per ml. So uh, th I'll just do quickly this. This is the spectrum here. I just want to wrap through it. We have something called the human photoprotective response, but it was so much like uh, the, the, the skin callus and the other issues that you've been told about earlier by Dr. Wunsch that I'll just skip through it here to the very last slide, uh, which is here. Uh, We'll just show these melanocytes. And there's the last slide. In honor of my late brother, Dr. Frank Garland, who participated in all the research uh, that you saw today from our lab. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cedric. Sure. Do we have time for one quick question? You know, uh, one, one slide. Everybody who doubts this in every disease, and this includes the editor of the New England Journal, simply says that vitamin D is reverse causation. Yes. There was a paper that was just published in the British Medical Journal that just obliterated that. Yes. Where, where they linked the uh, genetic determinants of vitamin D metabolism, the 7 R, or 2R1 enzyme, and the uh, cholesterol reductase, and showed when those are genetically low, the incidence of, 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 the only one that didn't pan out was cardiovascular, all the other ones. And so the reverse causality part has just been Yes, improved. that's right, Bruce. I agree with you 100%. Other studies are pending showing that inflammation does not increase the rate of metabolism of 25 points D. But so I don't know where they got the idea. The people who wrote uh, the editorial against that paper still don't believe it. Yeah. It was a pathetic editorial. It was pathetic. <laughs> Two votes for that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.